welcome to the very important show uh, in part of the In Harmony with Nature. Uh, today we'll be talking about um, wetlands on an international scale. I'm your host, Shalom Mandeville. I'm very proud to present to you um, a very distinguished international scientist, Dr. Evel Gorham. He was born in Halifax and he obtained his master's degree in Dalhousie and did his PhD in London. He, he, he taught ecology and behavioral biology in London, University of Toronto, and Minnesota. And um, the several magazines I've read, um, he, they, they consider him as the first to finger acid rain. I'm very proud that you are gracing our show, Dr. Gorham. Pleased and, to be here. And um, I guess we should get along with discussing wetlands, both in a rural and urban perspective, and why should we worry about them? Well, one of the reasons we should worry about wetlands, Shalom, is that there's so much of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I propose to do is to show some slides uh, in sequence to show you something about their distribution and what they look like, because most people have not seen them. Certainly most people have not seen them from the air, which is where they're often at their most fascinating. So what I've done is to bring a bunch of slides to show what the peatlands look like, the wetlands, and what some of the organisms are like there. And we can talk about some of the problems along the way. So if we can look at the first slide, you'll see that uh, there's a map there of the globe. And the green areas at the top of the uh, globe are peatland areas, the major areas of wetland. The thing to notice is that most of the wetlands are in the boreal zone. They spread through uh, Finland, Scandinavia, the Soviet Union and most of boreal Canada. Most Canadians, indeed most people, don't realize that 14% of the Canadian landmass is wetlands. And if there's that much of a wetland area, perhaps it's something we ought to be concerned about. So that's the distribution. If we look at Canada itself, the bluey-green areas are the major areas of wetland, and you can see that the densest wetland area is along the shore of Hudson James Bay. That's where the most important wetlands are. And these wetlands are important not only as wildlife habitat, they're also very important in the global carbon cycle, and they may be major actors if we go through a global warming cycle, which will oxidize a lot of the carbon locked up in the peat there. They're 350 times 10 to the 15th grams. That's 350 million billion tons, and there's a lot of carbon there. So. If that starts to oxidize and get released to the atmosphere, we may have some problems in the global warming scenario. On the other hand, peatlands emit methane, the second most important greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide, and that methane emission will shut down. So how the balance of these processes will play out is anybody's guess. We know there's a lot of wetland area involved. We know it's likely to be important. We don't know enough to say how important. So that's the distribution in Canada. If we look uh, now to see what some of the wetlands are like, this is a uh, peatland in the um, Cape Breton Highlands. Now, peatlands are wetlands with a lot of organic matter stored in them, where the soil is, is largely organic and to a depth of more than 40 or 50 centimeters. And some of these peat deposits are five or six meters deep. That, that's a rather pretty area in the Cape Breton Highlands. Uh, here we have a, a, wet, a peatland in Labrador with a very fascinating pattern of ridges and troughs, the troughs filled by open water with a lot of open water at the top. We don't know what produces those landscape patterns. We're just beginning to unravel the forces that produce a, a vegetation pattern like that. Here's another set of wetlands, the brown areas interspersed among the forested green areas in Labrador. Uh, oh, something's happened to my slide. The top of the slide shows uh, some peatlands in northern Minnesota with ridges and troughs along the, uh, across the axis of water flow with those uh, brown islands of, of tamarack and bog birch running with the line of water flow. A fascinating pattern. Here's another peatland in northern Minnesota with a big bog island of black spruce and sphagnum moss sitting in the midst of a sea of sedge meadows. And uh, there's deep peat under those. And the kinds of patterns you see there are, are uh, probably the most delicate adjustment of hydrology and vegetation that you'll see on the face of the planet. It's an extremely fragile ecosystem, very easily altered by anything that changes the hydrology of the site, and so these, these are particularly liable to, to uh, human intervention. 
here are some of the uh, peatlands in the Hudson Bay lowland, and notice the amount of open water there. Uh, a lot of that may very well dry up under, under global warming. Here's another shot of those same peatlands in the Hudson Bay to show just how much open water there is there. And that can be important uh, for migrating birds, although it's the coastal wetlands on Hudson Bay that are most important for the migrating waterfowl. Uh, here we can look down on the ground. These are a couple of my students sampling the acidity of bog pools. And I might point out that bo the bog pools contribute acidity to lakes downstream, and the, the streams draining the bogs uh, put a lot of colored organic acids into the waters. So natural organic acidity from peatlands is a factor in lake acidification, to which is added the uh, effect of acid rain. Dr. So Gorham, peatlands play a part there, too. Um, Dr. Gorham, I was told by somebody that, uh, you know, as you know, I mean, if you can, like, uh, channelize uh, stormwater in urban areas through, through uh, peatlands, which are high acidic, that uh, they would kill the, the, um, the fecal coliforms uh, which are the ones that are responsible to close many beaches. Uh -huh. Is this question uh, like a... Well, uh, I'm not an expert on this sort of pathology, but certainly a lot of wastewater can be drained through peatlands and can be purified thereby, and some of the nutrients can be taken out and stored in the form of peat. Uh, the consequence of diverting large amounts of stormwater through wetlands or peatlands will certainly be to purify the waters to some degree, depending on, on the size of the peatland and the, the speed of the flow. It will also alter the wetlands. So we want to be very sure that if we're going to use wetlands like that for such a purpose, that we have lots of other pristine wetlands to remind us of what our natural wetland heritage has been like. Um, while we are on that topic, uh, is it possible to create artificial peatlands? Uh, well, it's certainly possible to create artificial wetlands mm -hmm. without but it takes oh, several thousand years to uh, produce uh, a peatland with several meters of peat. It accumulates at about half a millimeter per year. So if you're talking about uh, creating a peatland that is deep, you're talking about hundreds, thousands of years to do so. Wetlands with cattails and reeds can be created very rapidly and are, in fact, are being created very rapidly in many riparian areas where people have uh, decided they want to develop wetlands and now are being forced to, reconsti to either reconstitute damaged wetlands elsewhere or to create new ones. Whether you can create the kind of wetlands you destroyed is m very much another matter. Very difficult to do that. Now here you see we're down on the ground. These are the bog mosses. The brown moss there is sphagnum, which is the bog moss that creates much of our northern peatlands in Canada. Uh, with some uh, bake apple on top, uh, which has berries that some people like and other people don't. It's something you have to become hab habituated to. If you look at the sphagnum in the side, you see that it continues to grow up upward and die beneath. And it's the, that dying moss beneath that creates the peat. And you can have several meters of that sort of material in the wetlands. Uh, here you see the heathy cover of uh, shrubs that often overlie many wetlands, huckleberries, blueberries, things of that sort with uh, some black spruce and tamarack in, in, on the peatland, a lot of tamarack seedlings in the foreground. Uh, here you see a peatland that has been drained, and one of the first signs of drainage is that the cotton grasses that show those white tufts take over as the sphagnum declines, and that's a very common sign of, of drainage, of human intervention to draw down the water table. Here is a, a wetland in Minnesota where the top moss has been scraped off for horticultural purposes, and here, more than a decade later, you can see it hasn't recovered very well. So unless you take special measures, you can damage a peatland to the point where it will take, as I say, decades to recover. And it won't be anything like what it was when you, uh, when you uh, destroyed it, the surface. Uh, we, of course, uh, see lots of peat fires on the uplands. We do see p fires on the peatlands, too. And under global warming scenarios, when the summers become warmer and drier, we may see a lot more of those fires destroying the peatland. Here's a peatland in northern Minnesota, and the, the second uh, island of black spruce and sphagnum from the bottom, the one that's nearest the left-hand side of the screen, shows a fire scar that, where a fire has burned through that peatland. Some of the ones in the background show natural openings that have developed through nature's own processes, but the, the fire scars there can often be recognized in the peat by layers of charcoal, and so we can get a fix on, on the fire history.
which, as I say, is likely to become much more uh, frequent if global warming takes effect on these peatlands. Here's a, peat, a peatland in the north of Britain, which is being destroyed by drainage for forestry. The Forestry Commission in Britain is a foresting thousands of acres with Sitka spruce, and to do that, they're destroying much of the breeding ground of northern wildfowl populations. And this has the ornithologists in Britain up in arms, not to say a lot of other nature lovers who don't like to see these pristine areas destroyed because they harbor a lot of interesting organisms. Here's a peatland in Britain that has been subject to centuries of overuse, overgrazing, burning, draining, and it is now eroding away so that you see caps of peat on the eroded soil. And, uh, of course, that's dumping not only peat downstream to, to cover up the spawning grounds of fishes, but also a lot of silt now that they've reached down to the mineral soil. So that's damage at its most severe, and we might see some of that under a global warming scenario. Now, here is what we talk about when we mean global warming. The incoming solar radiation, which is shortwave radiation, uh, gets re-radiated from Earth as longwave radiation, and that longwave radiation can be retarded in its escape by the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, chlorofluorinated hydrocarbons, the so-called freons we have in our uh, air, con uh, air conditioners in cars and in refrigerators, uh, some other gases as well. And so they retard the re-radiation of, of long-wave rays from, from the sun originally, and the atmosphere heats up. Now, this is a scenario from uh, one of the more severe uh, mathematical models. This suggests that in the center of the continent, the summer temperatures may heat up as much as 9 degrees, and the, the uh, soil moisture in the agricultural lands may decrease as much as 40 percent. The orangey-brown area on the left shows the temperature increase centering on Lake Winnipeg and northern Minnesota and the Dakotas, and the brown area on the right shows the zone of very serious soil moisture deficit. Now, if, if those scenarios come, come to pass, uh, whether rapidly or slowly, then we shall see major alterations not only in the, the ecosystems most of us are familiar with, but with the peatland. And uh, one of the reasons is that the temperature rise that we project is likely to be highest in northern latitudes. Now, that's a picture of the projected temperature rise as it's presented by four different climatic models for the future, for a doubling of greenhouse gases owing to fossil fuel combustion. And you see that the curve sweeps up very rapidly between about 40 and 70 degrees north. That's where most of the peatlands lie in the world. So it's there where the temperature effects are going to be greatest that the peatlands are concentrated. And it's also there that most of the peatlands are located in discontinuous permafrost. Now, the, in this map of Canada, the darkened areas are the major peatland areas. The heavy dashed line at the top shows the southernmost zone of permanent permafrost. The lighter dashed line beneath shows the, zone, the lower limit of the zone of discontinuous permafrost. Most of the peatlands lie in the zone of discontinuous permafrost, and most of the permafrost is in the peatlands. Here's a picture of some in Alaska with a very distinguished ecologist, Dwight Billings, by the side. That permafrost, under these climatic warming scenarios of extreme winter warming, will probably melt. Now, a lot of that will run off and will erode the landscape and dry, dry out the peatland, which will start oxidizing the peat, releasing CO2 on the one hand, shut down the methane emissions as the anaerobic bacteria are, are no longer able to function well. And as I say, we don't know how that scenario will play out at all. Uh, not only will there be erosion, some of that landscape where the permafrost melts will sink and there will be thaw lakes formed. But these two will later be taken over by vegetation and restart the peat accumulation game again. And so this is a very complex picture as to what global warming will do in the northern landscape. We really have just begun to think about unraveling it. We have very little evidence, but we know that there's a huge reservoir of carbon there, that the methane contributions of the peatlands are major, and we just don't know how they'll all play out. Now let me turn to what will happen in the prairie lakes of Minnesota, where I'm currently working. Uh, this is a lake in western Minnesota. The outer limits of the brown show the normal lake limits for that, that lake as it stands now. The blue shows where the lake sat in the 1930s drought. Uh, 
Now, the 1930s drought is what we shall see repeated over and over again, more and more frequently and more severely, if global warming comes to take place. So that lake, Norway Lake in Kandiohai County in Minnesota, will probably pretty well dry up under, under the severe global warming scenarios. Uh, if we have less severe global warming, it may take longer, but unless we do something to control emissions, it will just put off the day at which that lake dries up. Now, much of that brown area will then become wetlands, and that, to, to a wetland ecologist, is just great, but it won't be so nice for the cottage owners. The green zones along the eastern margin represent where cottages have been built, and they will see their, their water line recede 100, 200, 300 yards away from, uh, uh, from uh, their cottages, which they won't like very much. Would that happen in um, the deep lakes, too? No, it, the deep lakes will shallow, but the amount of shoreline that distance to traverse to open water will still be fairly small. Uh, but it will be annoying to see that decline because all that muddy uh, zone will have to be re-eroded into the lake, uh, new shorelines established, and I'm sure cottage owners won't be too pleased by that either. This is what happened to some of the prairie pothole lakes in the Dakotas during the drought of 1976-77, not very long ago. The little pothole lake in the foreground dried up completely. You can still see a faint trace of blue beyond where there's another pothole lake that did manage to maintain some open water. But the prairie pothole country is going to show much more like this. Though those dried up lakes, again, will be con colonized by reeds and cattails. Uh, but if the warming goes on long enough, even those will dry up and the prairie pothole company, com country will uh, be devastated. Now, the, this becomes particularly interesting in terms of duck populations. Let me show you here a picture of a piece of Saskatchewan uh, over a time scale through the 50s and 60s. Now, the upper blue curve shows the amount of open water in this piece of landscape uh, over the years. And you'll see that there was a little drought, a minor drought in the late 50s, and a more severe drought in the early 60s when the amount of open water vanished almost to nothing. Notice below the, the uh, brown curve shows the numbers of breeding pairs of ducks. And you can see that the duck populations parallel the water, table, the water uh, area curve rather nicely. They decline in the first drought, they recover a little, decline again in the second drought, recover, decline again. But notice that the duck populations do not recover as rapidly as the water they lag behind in their recovery time because they can't breed fast enough. And what that means is if you keep increasing the frequency of droughts, the duck populations will go to nothing, go to zero. Now this is a serious matter, and it's not being given enough attention. The, you may not know it, but the, the Canadian Wildlife Service, Ducks Unlimited, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service plan to spend $1.5 billion over the next 15 years to restore duck habitat in North America. It's the so-called North American Waterfowl Plan. And they're going to spend that money without much thought at all about what global warming might do to that landscape. Uh, I called the chief research scientist of Ducks Unlimited to see what they, were, what they were thinking about in terms of global warming effects in their rehabilitation plan. He said they have all the, pro all the problems they can deal with in, in trying to figure out what they're going to do next year to rehabilitate the lands they're losing without thinking about what might happen 10, 20, 30, or 40 years down the road. I had one of my friends at the University of Minnesota call a uh, senior scientist in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to ask the same question, and he got the same answer. When I talk to people in Canada who are interested in these matters, they too uh, are not giving serious thought to this. One and a half billion dollars spent without any thought of what global warming might do to this, this landscape and to those duck populations. Now, I, it's my contention uh, that some careful thought might allow the rehabilitation plan to go forward in the way that would, would at least uh, take account of what uh, global warming might do so that it would focus on their, those areas least sensitive to global warming and most likely to, uh, to stay the course in terms of providing duck habitat as global warming takes over. So that, I think, is a very serious problem for us to face in the future. It won't be so serious down here in Atlantic Canada, but it's going to be a major problem in western Canada, in the prairie provinces, and in the Great Plains of the USA. Let me uh, switch now to 
just show you some of the plants that inhabit these peatlands, just to show that there are interesting organisms out there. This is one of the bog mosses that one finds in richer cedar swamps, for example. It's called Sphagnum wolfianum, a rather nice name. Here's another sphagnum that's commoner in moderately acid habitats. And here's one of the bog mosses that characterizes the hummocks on the most acid of our peatlands. Uh, here we see the Labrador tea uh, flowering in early spring, as it will be uh, any time now, soon, in Nova Scotia. It uh, goes right across the boreal zone. Uh, here is the leather leaf, uh, or sometimes called Cassandra. Again, an early spring flowering plant. Very common on peatlands here in Nova Scotia and across, uh, across North America. Uh, here's the bake, bake apple in flower. This, as I say, has edible berries, very popular in Newfoundland. Uh, the, it does occur in Nova Scotia, though less commonly. Uh, here's the cotton grass that I talked about earlier, the uh, very pretty uh, plant that disperses its seeds with these feathery, uh, feathery uh, plumes. And here's a very, uh, what we in Minnesota regard as a rare plant. It's called yellow-eyed grass, and we only have about six populations in Minnesota that we know of. It's quite common on the eastern coastal plain, but we're very concerned not to lose it because it's in very sensitive habitats in wetland Minnesota. So it's a plant of considerable interest to us. Uh, here it is up close, uh, so you can see. It's a tiny flower, but very easy to spot in the, in the field. And here is one of the... Uh, insectivorous plants, the carnivorous plants, the sundew that has those little droplets of sticky liquid that traps uh, flies and insects and the uh, frond then of the leaf then closes over and secretes digestive enzymes to obtain primarily nitrogen in, in these nitrogen starved peatland habitats. Here's the flower of the bladderwort, another carnivorous plant that has little bladders that trap crustaceans out of the water in the wetland pools. And here is the pitcher plant. Uh, it's rather dark here, but you can see the flowering stalk. Very characteristic of this area, also very common in Minnesota. And here's one of the bog orchids, uh, Arethusa, I think, sitting uh, in a low black spruce uh, bed here. Here's another of the white flowering orchids, the Habanaria, a rather attractive plant of some of the richer peatlands. And there are microscopic algae in the water about which we know relatively little. We had a Chinese-American student studying these forests in Canada, one of the very first studies of this kind in North America, uh, to do it in detail across the country. And we learned a lot. Some of those, the, the desmids, of the kind you see here, are, are rather, rather pretty organisms, rather attractive under the microscope. There's a whole range of invertebrate organisms. This is the bog copper butterfly, but there are lots of other invertebrate organisms, flies, uh, lepidopterans, beetles, grasshoppers, you name it, about which we know almost nothing. The invertebrate fauna of the peatlands is very little known, particularly in North America, and I suspect that there are dozens of rare and endangered species of which we know nothing at all, simply because we've never investigated them. We don't know much about the food chains on these peatlands and what these invertebrates mean to the higher, higher organisms. Here's a great gray owl sitting on a peatland in Minnesota. Uh, hard to see. And there's a magnolia warbler that uh, uses the peatlands as a touchdown uh, spot during migration. And the spruce grouse, which inhabits our northern peatlands, this is uh, on the nest, and uh, a rather darker variety than normal that seems to characterize the peatlands of northern Minnesota. Here's a bo southern bog lemming, one of the small rodents that uh, forms the food of the great gray owl, I'm sure, and foxes and other organisms that, that inhabit that landscape. Uh, there are several voles and shrews. And, of course, moose like to inhabit the margins of the peatlands and the wetlands where there's a lot of uh, alder and willow scrub just around the margins where the richer waters drain in off the uh, mineral substrate, the mineral upland. So moose hang around the, uh, the marginal wetlands of the big peatlands. And, of course, you'll see them out on the peatlands in Cape Breton as well. The last time I was up in the, on a Cape Breton peatland, we saw a cow moose and her calf uh, eating water lily rhizomes from, the, uh, from some of the pools on the wetlands. And I had a wonderful experience once in Nova Scotia of being across on the other side of a cove where a cow moose was in a bed of yellow water lilies, and she would rear up on her hind legs and come crashing down with her forelegs to loosen these rhizomes from the mud at the bottom. And then she would chomp them up as they floated to the surface. And just a marvelous sight. Now, perhaps I, I think uh, the last of the uh, 
species that I wanted to show in the peatlands is the bog ecologist, and this is one <laughs> of my uh, students, uh, just a little close to dinner time, trying to tell us it's time to go in and, uh, and have something to eat after a long day. So that uh, shows you something of what the peatlands are like and why I think they deserve attention. They're 14% of Canada's area. They're very diverse. They have fascinating landscape patterns. They undoubtedly contain a wealth of rare and endangered species that are not only interesting, but, uh, but may have things to tell us. Sometimes people say, well, what use is a southern bog lemming? Or what difference does it make if we preserve the, that orchid, have an area dilatata on the peatland? And I have a very simple reply. Suppose 150 years ago, housewives had been able to wave a magic wand to get rid of nuisances in the kitchen. One of the things they would have gotten rid of was fruit flies. Mm -hmm. buzz around uh, ripening fruit. Another of the things they would have waved their magic wand over was bread mold. And yet, much of what we've learned about human heredity comes from a study of fruit flies, and George Beadle and uh, his colleague uh, Tatum in the United States won a Nobel Prize for working out the so-called one gene, one enzyme theory, which won them the Nobel Prize, and which taught us how genes regulate enzymes. So even the most insignificant organism may have a lot to tell us, and we don't want to get rid of any of them without thought. Aldo Leopold probably said it best. He said, the first principle of intelligent tinkering is not to discard any of the parts. And I think we should take that advice to heart in concerning what we do with our wetlands. I also understand that um, wetlands are very unique in the genetic diversity. Well, there are lots of different organisms out there mm -hmm. that are characteristic of wetlands that you don't find anywhere else. And they are genetically distinct, of course, from the organisms on many of the organisms on the uplands. If we lose them out there, we will have lost them for good because those are the only places they inhabit. And yet some of them are relatives of uh, plants we're interested in. Some of them uh, may have, there may be strains of black spruce and tamarack that, that can contribute to the germplasm of our cultivated strains when we start to cultivate black spruce and tamarack, as we inevitably will. So yes, there's, there's a lot of genetic diversity out there, and as I say, we shouldn't cast any of it aside without taking thought, because we may, in fact, discard something that will be valu would be valuable to us had we preserved it. Once we learn what its place is in nature, the problem, the overall problem we have, not just concerning peatlands, but concerning the world ecosystem, is that as scientists, we're just barely beginning to learn how the world works. And yet, uh, technology and industry are far ahead of us. They are capable of damaging or destroying planetary ecosystems uh, while we don't have the knowledge of how to restore them. So our best bet is to protect them and by regulating industry and technology uh, keep from doing the damage that we're so easily capable of now that we're working on nature's own scale. We're operating on the scale of nature herself without the knowledge of how nature works so that we don't know how to protect the planet. The best thing in such a case, if you don't know, go slow. Well, I was reading an article the other day that said that um, maybe a long time ago they would have thought the moles, you know, were useless, but that's where penicillin comes from, right? That's right. <laughs> and that's, a, again, another thing that the housewife would have waved her magic wand over, the penicillium that, uh, that covers uh, rotting uh, uh, oranges and so on, would certainly have been banished forever had we had the way to do it 150 years ago. Uh, one other point I might make about wetlands is that if you live in the city, the chances are that the single bit of landscape that is reasonably pristine in your city is likely to be whatever bit of wetland may be preserved there. If they are preserved, they tend to be left alone in terms of the fact that most people don't use them very heavily because they get their feet wet. And so those wetlands are often the last bit of real nature, as nature was before we disturbed it, well, in, in the urban area. I guess uh, we have run out of time now, and um, I guess we can continue this discussion in the next show. And uh, I invite the audience to watch um, this show next.